find that it's Super Bowl <laughs> Sunday once again. It's amazing how quickly this time flies and rolls around again. I got to thinking about the athletes and you, you ever thought about you know some of the original Super Bowl uh, Sundays, uh, you know the games that were played back when they wore just leather helmets, you know, <laughs> and, and they didn't have pads and I mean those guys were tough. You know, the, the, imagine getting hit like they get hit today wearing just that, and uh, you probably would be taken out. I mean, you probably wouldn't return to the game anytime soon. But it's amazing, uh, you know, some of the equipment they have now, you know, how they can uh, take some of these uh, impacts and then get right back up and go back and play another round, you know, and uh, it's amazing, you know. I got to thinking about, you know, you know, some of the technology that goes into it, it it's truly astounding, you know, uh, some of the designs, you know, just, can you imagine, though, if they would have went old school with some of that stuff? I mean, for protection, you know, like with tanks, you know, their, their idea of protection is you put more layers on, right? Thicker and thicker armor. I mean, what a game it'd be if they had to go out there and weigh, you know, wear 200 pounds worth of protective equipment. I mean, you know, then the plays would be a little bit slower. You know, it'd be like, okay, he's running down the field, and we'll come back in 10 minutes, see if he makes it, you know. Um, you know, and, and you imagine, you know, and, and you think about, like, even, you know, the people that are in, you know, drag cars and stuff, how they're all bundled up, so if they do wreck, you know, they don't get hurt. Imagine if the football players were bundled up like that, you know, just their little feet maybe down below, you know, being able to run or something, you know, so... <laughs> It's quite amazing, but you know, the, the reason that their equipment is designed such is so that they can run fast, right? So that they can move quickly, you know, it kind of goes back to the idea, you know, back to the, uh, the, the early days of, the, of the, the Greek games. You know, the runners there, I mean, they wouldn't wear big heavy parkas if it was cold outside. I mean, if it was cold and they were running, they would still strip down, right? Because they knew that, uh, you know, if you're, you're wearing something that's going to catch a lot of wind, it would slow you down. You know, same thing with, you know, uh, you know in the early games, they ran barefoot because, you know, the, the sandals of the day, we, you know, they're not like our Nikes and our other products that we have out there today that, you know, promote running fast, right? So, you know, the, the idea would be that they, that they would remove those things that would slow them down. You know, and, and it's interesting how, you know, just in football, they've been able to design things that don't slow them down, but yet protect them, right? Well, you know, the reason I was thinking about this, I was, I was going back over a passage we've been looking at many times. And, it, and it's Hebrews chapter 12, if you want to turn there, it's just the first verse. Because we're encouraged, you know, to meditate on God's word. Because, you know, when you meditate or, you know, the idea is to ruminate, to, to bring God's word back up and chew on it some more. You find things in there that make you, you, you see a, a different aspect or a, a different perspective of what God's trying to tell us. So in Hebrews chapter 12, let's just read the first verse there. It says, therefore, and again we stop because, you know, it's, it's follow, following, you know, chapter 11, which is the halls of faith. Talking about all the, 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 the great people of the Old Testament, uh, of things that they did, uh, of their accomplishments, and, and their ability to overcome because of their faith. You know, so he, it starts out in chapter 12, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. As I was thinking about that, that passage right there, it starts out and it says, let us throw off everything that hinders. Maybe your version says everything that weighs you down. You know, the idea, is, it's the Greek word of obkos. And it's a burden, it's a weight, it's an encumberment, a bulk, a mass, or, or a load. You know, you get rid of all those things. It kind of goes back to that idea of the, of the runner, right? The Greeks, you know, they, they, would, they would remove all those things that might slow them down. You know, you look at professional swimmers. I mean, they're very streamlined. They, I mean, they go so far as removing every bit of hair that might slow them down. You know, they put either a cap on or they shave because it gives them just that little bit extra uh, advantage. Well, here, we're being encouraged to remove all those things that might encumber us, 
weighed us down. You know, here we're, you know, we've looked at the halls of faith in chapter 11 and seen their faith. Now we're being encouraged. You know, look at your own life. You know, do you have something in your life that's spiritually weighting you down? The writer here is telling you, get rid of it. You know, so that way you can be ready to run. And, 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 and it says also, and the sin that so easily entangles. You know, we're not talking here the big sins. We're talking about those little things. Maybe those little hatreds or bitternesses that we have in our lives, those things. The, you know, the idea, you know, here would be, you know, the, like a, you know, for a swimmer, it would be like this maybe seaweed that gets wrapped around your legs and slowly starts slowing you down. You know, do you have things like that in your lives? And, 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 the, and, the, and, and we're to run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. To run. You know, you get this idea here. You know, I know my daughter, she, she's a cross-country runner. But that, that's a whole different idea there. This idea to run with, uh, with perseverance, it's, the idea here is trecho is the word in Greek, I think. I might probably mispronounce that. But it's running wide open. You know, cross-country runners don't run wide open, do they? Not for the most part, unless you're really good, right, Nick? <laughs> run wide open conveys intense desire to get to the goal as quickly as possible. To, you know, so we're, we're encouraged to do these things. So, you know, there's some hindrances out there. The enemy is constantly throwing these little things at us, isn't he? Or maybe just life in general, throw these things at us. And, and it's really easy to become weighted down by them. So I wanted to look at another passage. And, and it's encouraging us to look at our lives. Do we have things in our lives that are weighing us down? That are, that are causing us to, to be hindered in our, in our relationship with God or in the, in the race that we've been called to run? So turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17, hopefully this is a very familiar passage. It's, it's a passage talking about David and Goliath. And, and I know about you, but I, I've heard this story many, many times. And, and you ask little kids that have been in Sunday school, and they'll tell you about how he took the rock and he, and he killed uh, Goliath, and he, he won the battle, right? <clears throat> but there was a battle that raged on before that battle happened. And I would ask you to kind of keep in mind maybe those things that may have hindered David and how he dealt with them. We're just going to go ahead and start out at verse 1 of chapter 17 and, and get an idea of what's going on here. And it says in verse 1, it says, Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Sokoth in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes Damon between Sokoth and Azekah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle lines to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied a hill, or one hill, and the Israelites uh, uh, another with the valley between them. So you get this picture, right? Two, two opposing armies. Each one of them has a, a piece of high ground. And in and, and, and the art of war, it's good to have high ground when you're dealing with foot soldiers, right? Because they have to come up to you. So they, they, they're, they're, they've drawn the lines and basically you can see these two armies taunting each other. Saying, go ahead and cross the valley, come on up and, and let's do some battle here. Verse 4 says, a champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. To give you an idea, that's like 125 pounds. So you've got a guy here that's almost 10 feet tall. He's over 9, going on 10. He wouldn't even fit in here. And he wears a coat that's 125 pounds. You know, have you seen some of the giants that they talk about in our days? There's been a guy that was like 8 foot tall. He wasn't what you would call well built. You know, I mean, he was very spindly. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that ain't this guy. I mean, to wear a coat, I mean, I, I complain when my coat weighs 5 pounds or 10 pounds. He's wearing a coat that weighs 125 pounds, okay? It says, uh, 
Uh, he, had, he had the bronze helmet on his head, wore a coat of scale armor uh, of bronze, weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs, he wore uh, bronze greaves, and bronze javelin was slung, slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. So you got a picture, right? We, we, we've heard of the giant Goliath. You know, and as far as an army goes, can it get any worse? Especially, you know, when you, you know, he's going to call them out, say, bring out your best and I'll, I'll come down and we'll fight. You know, can, can, the, can the enemy be any bigger? You know, and no. In that day, I mean, you know, they're used to going up people of their own size, but here, here's the ultimate tank. You know, this guy, you know, basically is undefeated, you know, and when he says, I'm coming out to get you, you know, you're probably scared. You know. And it says... In verse 8, Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. So we got a picture of this battle. The enemy is calling out, calling you out to fight. And it says here that, you know, Saul, they, they just come off of a great victory. You know, some time before this, that they'd gone out and they defeated the Philistines and thought, hey, we're, we're doing great. And Saul was their champion. You know, he stood a, a head above every, everybody else in the nation. He was their idea of a king. And it says even he was terrified. That's not a good sign when your leaders are terrified. Battle probably isn't going to go too well, is it? You know, so the, and, and, and Goliath is saying, aren't you guys the, the ones that just, can't, you know, you defeated us before? Come on out, whip us again. I'll tell you what, if, if, we, if you defeat us, we'll be, we'll be your servants. And, but if we defeat you, you will be our servants. I, I think right now, the, you know, I mean, this, this picture of the nation, they're terrified. They don't want to fight him. Because they know, we don't have anybody that can stand up to this guy. Look at him. You know, I've heard some estimates that said he probably weighed about 800 pounds. That's, that's, a, that's a big boy. <laughs> and you don't go out picking fights with somebody like that, right? So, I mean, really, you think about it. What, what hope do they have? You know, things are looking pretty grim. So it continues on. Now David was the son of the Ephraite named Jesse. Ephrathite named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons, and in Saul's time, he was old and well advanced in years. So it's been some time since the defeat of the, the Philistines, and it says he's you know basically really old now. All right, um, Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to the war. The first was Eliab, the second Abin uh, excuse me Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. Now Jesse said to his son David, Take this ephah of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take along these ten, cheese, uh, ten cheeses to the commander of the unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. They are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. So here we have the setup for the story, right? You know, Jesse is saying, hey, go out and bring back some news. It's been a long time. Forty days. It seems like the battle, you know, it should be already over. 
but, but he's asking, hey, you know, go ahead and take this stuff to your brothers and, and, and you know, here's some cheese for, for the commanders, you know, and you know, show them some goodwill and, and that should make, you know, you, the, the leaders of your brothers, you know, happy and, and bring back some good news, some assurance, okay? Um, early in the morning, verse 20 says, David left the flock with, his, with a shepherd, loaded up and set, it, uh, set out as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle lines, and greeted his brothers. And he was talking with them. Goliath the Philistine champion from Gath stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. When the Israelites saw the man, they all ran from him in great fear. Now the Israelites had been saying, Do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and with the, uh, will exempt his father's family from taxes in Israel. So we get a little picture here of, of Israel their motive behind things. They said, well, if anybody goes out here and, and defeats this, uh, this giant, here's what the king will do for him. Wealth, the, the, the king's daughter, exempt from taxes. I mean, in the world that we live in, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? You know, hey, if you go out and, and, and do these things, you're going to be wealthy, you're going to have great influence with the king, you marry his daughter, and you'll be exempt from taxes. That alone right there should have motivated somebody, right? Their, their motive is all wrong, isn't it? It's about what the king will do for you. See, they've been putting all their faith and their, and their hopes in their king, but yet now he's old. And even he's scared. It sounds like Israel's almost defeated before the battle even begins. Do you think that they've been weighed down? I think so. They've been encumbered with, uh, with some burdens here. You know, God, God had wanted to be the, 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 the leader of the nation. He, he wanted to be the king of the nation, yet they rejected God. So they wanted a, a king just like everybody else. And so God anointed Saul through the prophet Samuel and said, here's your king. And come to find out he ain't everything that they thought he was going to be, right? He'd done a few good things, but yet now he's even scared. David asked the men standing near him, What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from the land? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? You think David's got to know something that the rest of the army doesn't hear? It's interesting he would use that term, this uncircumcised Philistine. What do you think David is referring to here? Well, circumcision was a sign of the covenant. He's basically saying, this guy don't have any covenant with God, but we do. He's come out to defy the, the armies of Israel, and, and, and we're God's chosen people. David's attitude's a little bit different than the armies, wasn't it? Than even Saul's. He's like, what are you guys afraid of? This is an uncircumcised Philistine. He ain't got the promise we do. And notice he says, you know, when he's asking, and who removes this disgrace from Israel? You know, David was thinking about the nation and about God and God's promises. Where the, the armies was thinking about their individual benefits from, from going out and killing this, this, this Philistine. Two different ideas here. One was for the glory of God. One was for the glory of man and for their king. Kind of totally different ideas there. Verse 27 says, They repeated to him what they had been saying and told him, This is what will be done for the man who kills him. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger and asked him, or burned with anger at him and asked, 
Why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the desert? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Now what have I done, said David? Can't I even speak? You know, here, here's the first challenge for David. In chapter 16, if you, if you did some back reading, you'll find out that in front of all of his brothers, Samuel came and anointed David as king. He was anointed as, as God's chosen one. Do you think that may have rubbed his brothers just a little bit wrong? You know, when Eliab first came out, you know, Samuel thought, surely, the, you know, God's anointed standing here in front of me. Because apparently he was an impressive young man too. Well, not young anymore. He's, he's the oldest of the brothers, so he's probably 30. I mean, a very mature man thinking, you know, hey, I should be king. I'm the oldest. And now, you know, here's David. And, and, and notice he says, I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. See, his brothers, his family starts pulling him down. Was David conceited? When, or what were the, was the armies of Israel the ones that were thinking about themselves, weren't they? David was thinking about the nation and about his God. Mm -hmm. and, and, and not only that, he says, you know, who did you leave those few sheep with there in the desert? David, he isn't the one that says, I'm just going to leave these sheep and go out and see what the battle is, you know, how it's going. His dad's the one that said, go and find out and take these supplies with you. David, right now, could have been beat down. He could have said, I, I give up. I'm leaving. My brother's a bully, and I, I don't like him. But he didn't let that get to him, did he? It says there in verse 30, He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter. And the men answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. See, it was overheard. You know, in our lives, is some of the things that we do overheard. You know, it says, uh, and I'll mess this one up, but some of the best sermons are, are, are not preached, but they're lived in front of others. David's attitude right here, you know, he could have turned around and started blowing off steam to somebody else saying, who does my brother think he is? What would have happened? He would have lost opportunity. It was overheard and that was reported to Saul. So David has maintained his thoughts and his way. Verse 32, it says, David said to Saul, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a boy, and he has been a fighting man from his youth. What if David was listening to the king at this point? I'm only a boy. Goliath's big. I, 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 I haven't been a fighter. I'm a shepherd. You know, I've been out there tending sheep, and this, this man is a man of war. Look at him. You know, he looks like a tank. Mm -hmm. he, he, his spear is, is huge. The javelin, I'm sure he could throw it far. His sword could lop you in a half with a single stroke. I mean, if he would have got his eyes focused on what Saul had just said, do you think he could have been discouraged? But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off the sheep from the flock, I went out after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. See, David's saying, you know what? I've been in practice. There was a bear. I killed him. There was a lion. I killed him too. Mm -hmm. Both of those things could kill a person, right? 
you know, David says, I've been in training. I went out there and, 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 and I, I was able to defeat this enemy. And this uncircumcised Philistine is no different. See, it didn't matter how big he was. Yes, he could have killed David, but you know what? David says, I'm not afraid of those things. I've been out there practicing. I know what I'm doing. <clears throat> but notice he says, also his main motive here says, he has defied the armies of the living God. Do you see David's heart? We're told later on that David was a man after God's heart. It was more important to him for the, for the glory of God here and, and, and God's chosen people than it was for himself. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Sounds like he's got a little bit of faith, doesn't he? It's not like, wait, I'm going to go do some praying real quick. Hold on, I'll be back in 20 minutes or something like that. I got, I got to get all prayed up. David isn't letting anything weigh him down. He came prepared. Notice Saul here says, Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Then Saul, notice this, then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. Saul said, but you know what? We're going to dress you up and make you look just like Goliath. You're going to look like our warrior. And here, let me put, you, put your, my armor on you. You know, Saul was a good head taller than everybody else. So you can almost imagine this would be like, you know, like a, a, a child putting on mom and dad's clothing. You know, I remember our kids, you know, they'd put on my boots and they'd go clear all the way up to their hips just about. You know, and I, I get this picture of David standing there, you know, the armor draped down all the way down to his ankles. You know, ka-chink, ka-chink, ka-chink. You know, can't even hardly walk. Can you get this vision in your, your mind too? And it says that he wasn't used to him. He hadn't proven these things, had he? You know, th this was foreign to him. Now, the king is the one that had given him these things, saying, you know what, we're going to dress you up just like him, and you're going to be able to go out there and do battle with Goliath. Because you got the same armor, you got sword, you know, you're good to go. David made a wise choice here, as we find out. He could have said, yep, this is what a warrior looks like. And I'll go out there as a warrior and I'll do battle with Goliath. In our lives, have you ever been told you need to look a certain way to be a Christian? Or to be an effective minister? I know I've been told as a pastor, well, you, you, you don't have the right armor on. You haven't been to seminary. Or you use the wrong Bible, or, or you know, all those comments. Maybe you've had them told to you in your lives too. You don't look like what you should look like. You're going up against the enemy. You gotta, you gotta look like what you know the world thinks that a uh, that a warrior should look like. And David's, he's, you know, he's like he tried moving around and he says it doesn't fit. He says there. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. That, that, that idea there in the Greek is nasa is the word, and it's to test and to try something, to prove it. David had never worn armor. Can you imagine trying to follow the sheep wearing a, a coat of, uh, of male armor? Sheep run fast. I know. Tried to catch some. It wouldn't work, would it? Or putting on a helmet. You know, it's hard enough seeing, but then you have something up here and you're trying to see where the sheep are going and they're running behind you and, you know, scattered all around. No, he was a shepherd. Throw it at the sheep. What is that? Throw it at the sheep. Throw it at the sheep, yeah. <laughs> here, take that. Whap. He said, I haven't proven them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, 
put them in the pouch as his shepherd or put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag and with his sling in his hand approached the Philistine. He went back to his old way of being a shepherd. You know, they had the rod. I mean, it sounds like, you know, the, the 23rd Psalm, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. He says, I've got my staff, my rod. I use it for protecting the sheep. Maybe when a coyote gets too close, you whap him with it. Mm -hmm. I've got my sling. You ever seen one of these uh, 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 shepherds use one of those slings? There's YouTube videos out there you can watch. I mean, they take a rock. I mean, it's not like a little pea shooter. You don't take a little rock like that. I mean, they're taking rocks. And they're zinging them out there. And when they hit the target, the rocks explode. They're good with them. He says, I know these weapons. I've proven them. I've killed a bear. I've killed a lion. Man, you you know, I, I'm sure as a shepherd, you kind of get bored. Probably sip you know, your Coke cans up out there and you use your sling and you're off you know, whacking them and stuff. He says, I know how to use these. And that's what he dressed himself up. He didn't allow himself to be encumbered by those things that he wasn't familiar with. The same applies for us in our lives. God has given you your tools, your abilities, your ways. God knows where you've spent your time and he's able to use those things. But the, the world... Maybe even religion says, no, you're supposed to look like this. I would encourage you. Be like David. Take the things that you have proven in your life. For me, it's my Bible. It's the Word of God. It's my sword. You know, we've, we've, we've mentioned many times, Guy and myself, you know, we're looking for a passage in the Bible, and we're not quite sure what the address is, but we know the page. And on that page, there's a green dot on the right-hand side about a quarter of the way down. We can, you know, it's underlined. That's what you're looking for because you've proven your weapon. That's the idea here. Don't be encumbered, burdened down, weighted down with things that are not correct. If David would have went out there dressed like Saul, like Goliath, he would have been defeated. But he says, I'm going to go back to what I know. Now it says, verse 41, Meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. I don't know about you, but if I was you know, David, I would probably be freaking out at this point, going, ah, he's getting closer. Because, you know, somebody that big, you know, they get close to you. They're going to whack you with that spear, or they're going to get you with the sword. You, you know that there's a problem, but it didn't phase David. Okay, he looked David over and saw that he was only a ruddy, or only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. David could have been intimidated at that point, couldn't he have? You know, this huge mountain of a man's coming after me and he's hurling insults at him. Have you ever been insulted as a Christian or put down for what you do for God? See, that's the idea that, that we face our own enemies. It could be from within the church. It could be within the or, you know, religious organizations. It could be within a family. Ever come up against a family member that would hurl insults at you and maybe you know, curse you in their God? And it would be real easy to become defeated. But here's David in verse 45. Said, David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. David's got a place of security, and, and he's willing to stand there, isn't he? I come to you in the name of God. What's our motive? What's our armor when we, when we go up against the enemy? 
there he said, and you're coming at me with physical things, but I'm coming at you with spiritual things. I'm a child of God. I'm, I'm a part of the nation of Israel. I'm a part of that promise. I'm a covenant member of God's family, and I'm coming against you in his name. Let me ask you, what weapon's more powerful than God? This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistines' army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. Look at David's motive. Was it this day the world will know that I'm a mighty warrior bigger than Goliath? His motive was that the, the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. What if God's people had that same faith that David did? And our motive was to glorify God the same way David's motive was. Do you think the world would look a little different right now? But we get caught in these squabbles of, no, we'll let the world know that we're the best church out there. We'll let the world know we got the best programs out there. We got the shiniest building or, you know, all these things that we got caught up in. Or maybe, maybe our motive should be, I, I want the world to know that we worship the true and living God and I serve him. That's what the world will know. And notice his faith. He says, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet him. You know, I don't know about you, but if I was going up against a big like, guy like that, I'd be thinking, maybe I can get around behind him and trip him. Or, you know, I'll, I'll be quick because he's big and slow, and I'll, I'll be that little thing that's real fast. No, David went right after him. He wasn't afraid. He wasn't intimidated. If he would have been wearing that armor that Saul had given him, how, how quick do you think he would have been? I can imagine a little kid there walking, you know, wait, I'll be right there. No. He, he rushed after Goliath. Mm -hmm. David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet him, reaching into his bag and taking out a stone. He slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. You know, there's a lot of people that said all David had to do was get that rock in the air and God was going to throw him you know, and cause the rest of it to happen. I, I kind of disagree here. This was David's weapon. He was good with it. He was proficient with it. Yes, God delivered Goliath into his hand, but God also used what David was good with. David didn't use the sword. He didn't use the spear or the javelin. He was a shepherd. And he knew how to sling those stones. And God used that. He used David's ability to win the battle. Now, you know, in, in, in a scenario of war, if you're going up against people with spears and javelins and swords, you don't throw rocks at them, right? It just doesn't make sense. But yet God can use the weak things and the things that are not to get glory for himself. God said, I'm going to use you, David, and your abilities. So all, all that time you spent out there, you know, knocking Coke cans off the hillside, that was preparation for the battle that you're going into right now. And I'm going to bless you for that. And I will get the glory because you were willing to give me the glory for what was about to happen. Now, if David would have been there going, better watch out. I'm really good with this thing. I can knock a Coke can off at 100 yards. Trying to give himself the glory. I think the battle would have come out a little bit different. But Goliath, he was coming after him with spear and sword thinking, I'm a mighty warrior and I'm going to lop you into pieces. David's like, no, I'm here and I'm doing battle for, for the God of Israel and for, for my God. And he's going to be the one to glorify because the world's going to know that there's a God in Israel, the God. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. 
Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. Do you see in this battle all the things that could have weighed David down? His brother getting after him. I know the kind of kid you are. You're just out here to see the battle, you know. You, 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 you're arrogant. You're just a, you know, you've been anointed as king, and yet, you know, here you are, you're just out here to watch things happen. I should have been the one anointed king. I'm the oldest. You could have got, let him get that, you know, into him. But he, he kept going. And Saul says, you're just a boy. You're going up against a man of war. He could have let that get inside of him, too, and he would have been defeated. And then when Saul said, well, go, but here, let's dress you up and make you look like a warrior. He could have said, okay, I've never done this before, but go ahead and, 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 and do that to me. Do you think that would have been a hindrance to David? Yeah. See, God has given each one of us abilities. He knows what we're proficient at, what we're good with, and he says, use those things. If he called you to minister to people, do what you know to ha what to do. If, you have if you're able to have compassion with people, have compassion with people. If you're able to relate to people, then, then relate to people. Those things are, are what we're good at. God says, I'll use those things. For David, it was a sling and a stone. Didn't make much sense, you know. But David was good with those things. What if he would have been off just a little bit and hit that helmet? It would have gone toing and flow off into the distance. But God blessed him. He used David's abilities and caused Goliath to fall. Going back to Hebrews chapter 12. Think about that when we reread verse 1. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders. Just like David. Don't be weighted down by the things that the world says you should have or what you should look like. God has called you and your abilities and who you are to his service. Throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. We gotta keep running, keep pushing on. Right now, the enemy is out there trying to encumber people. I don't know about you, but it seems like everywhere you turn, things are so much easier to get a hold of. There's so much out there that could weight a person down. So much sin that's out there that could easily entangle us. I mean, I mean, all, all it takes, I mean, these smartphones, they're incredible tools. But they're also very tempting to how easy it would be to just enter in and, and, and allow sin to come into your life through that, that gateway right there. Mm -hmm. Not just that, but all around us, how easy is it to become entangled in the days that we live in? Things are so easy to, to get a hold of. We're in an instant society. If you want something, you can have it. They'll deliver it tomorrow on your front doorstep. Let us run with perseverance. You know, to run again. Running wide open. Are we running wide open? And if you're running wide open, you know those things that slow you down. For me, if I try riding, running wide open, it's usually a side stitch or a cramp or something going on there or I trip. You know, I know those things that slow me down when I try to run wide open physically. But how, how about spiritually? Are we running wide open? Are we that trained athlete where we know what things are dragging us down? Those things that are weighting us down, hindering us, or those sins that so easily entangle us, trip you up? 
God says, let's just keep running with perseverance. Not only that, it says in verse 2, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. See, Jesus defeated Goliath, the enemy, death, sin, all those things. And not only that, but then he says, the, the very things that he used to defeat the enemy, he says, I give them to you. The word of God, the shield of faith, the breastplate of righteousness. We won't get into all the armor of God, but God says, here, use these. They work. They defeated the enemy. Let's keep our eyes on Jesus. Don't keep the eye, your eyes on the world. Right now, the political situation will drive you crazy. All the bickering that's going on out there, all the, the, the darkness. Yeah, there's COVID out there. But you know what? When we keep our eyes on Jesus, you know, things are, he says he'll give us peace. His peace he leaves with us. In this world, you're going you're gonna to go through some stuff. Tribulations, trials, hard times, because we live in a fallen world. But just like he tells us over there in Hebrews 13, I will never leave you, never will I forsake you. Let's keep our eyes on Jesus. Let's keep running the race. And I would ask you, look at your life. Is there something that's holding you back? Something that's tripping you up. Get rid of those things. That way we can run the race that we've been called to run. Mm -hmm. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you for your word and the encouragement that we get from your word. Lord, from, from the stories of, of, of the great men of the Old Testament to, to the, the faith of the of the, of the disciples and the believers in the New Testament there. Lord, they're all there to encourage us to run. Lord, show us in our lives those things that are hindering us, weighting us down. Whether it be family members, Lord, uh, just speaking negatively to us or, or, or for, for the enemy coming against us saying you know, that we don't look like we should or, or saying that we have to put on things that we're not used to, Lord. I just ask that you would encourage us and to help us keep our eyes focused only on you and your son. For the love that you've poured out through your son to us, Lord. And help us to run the race with perseverance you've called us to run. Lord, we're asking for your spirit once again to be poured out upon your people. And give us, Lord, the, 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 the boldness to go out and proclaim the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. Would, uh, take your hymnals and turn uh, with us to hymn number 320.